Thank you for being here. Glad to be here. <laughs> so for all the people who uh, weren't able to catch uh, the last episode, um, you uh, have brought very nice stuff here and in specifically uh, tool assisted speed friends. Yes? Yes. All kinds of fun stuff. Uh, we did an episode earlier on Super Mario Brothers 2 and Mario Brothers 3. Yeah. A lot of the stuff I'll be talking about here will reference back to that material. Mm -hmm. This is Zelda, though, and I love me some Zelda. Uh, me too, me too. This particular tool-assisted speedrun mm -hmm. of The Legend of Zelda, the original, was done by someone in our community named, uh, named uh, Lord Tom. This particular video from, or this particular game from Task Videos, or run from Task Videos, is a lot of fun to watch, has mm -hmm. a lot of tech, and it's worth watching. So I'm going to kick it off here. I'm going to power this console off, mm -hmm. which will kill the video signal here. Start the output to TaskBot, and three, two, one, go. With any luck, everything will work perfectly. Yeah, we had a little bit of technical uh, trouble here because there's so much stuff that has to work together. So let's hope for the best here. That's right. There is this fear in me every time I go to an event mm -hmm. that I don't think will ever go away. Because if you think about the absurdity of what we're doing, it's a miracle it works at all. We have a, in this case, 22 minute long sequence of button presses and mm -hmm. not a single button press can be lost. <laughs> if even one frame worth of input is mangled in any way, the entire run desynchronizes from there on out because we did not perform perfectly. Yeah, that's that's the thing we found out. Um, we tried it out beforehand and you were using the reset um, to start the run yeah. and that was causing a desync. That caused a desync, which that happens. So this particular run, you'll see that Lord Tom is taking some very risky strategies. Right here in particular, you'll see some manipulation of enemy placement to get all of the enemies clustered in just the right place. You're seeing damage boosting happening mm -hmm. here where deliberate damage is used to get us faster to the destination. That was an in-game reset used by, used by uh, in this case, used to get back to the beginning of the dungeon quicker yeah, as a death Faster orb. than running out. Yeah. Right. That uses the second controller, so in this case I have two controllers connected to TaskBot. You'll see some item manipulation there. We need rupees. So what happened there was forcing a five rupee to appear. There, there was a forced bomb drop. Mm -hmm. Now when I say forced, we're getting deterministic results. As described in the last episode, because we fully control all input, it's possible to do things like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> manipulate okay. the game into doing exactly what you want. Getting enemies to go where you want sometimes by changing what movement you make to influence the direction the enemy goes. Uh, you can do things like forcing the uh, the drops to be exactly what you want. Maybe by delaying for a second, going a slightly different direction, hitting a different button. There's all kinds of different techniques that cause it to re-seed the random number generation sequence differently and result in a different but deterministic result. Yeah, totally. While playing, normally playing Legend of Zelda, especially um, farming bombs or something like this was a thing that took up a lot of time. Yes. And here you can kind of determine when to get bombs and when you need them. Right. And you get to know exactly where the enemy is going to be, basically be going because you've peeked into the future and mm -hmm. then backed up and tried again, avoiding what, getting in their way, if you will. And also the thing we've seen in the beginning, I think I've seen this in other speed runs, you're exiting at one side uh, during the screen transition, but I think, what was it? You have to push uh, the button to the other direction very fast and you're uh, coming out in the other way. Right, those screen uh, warping where you're seeing us yeah. wrap around the screen happens in a variety of... Wow, that is so good, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I wish I could play like it's that. It's always impressive. Well, it, it it's fun to watch because you get to see what would happen if you had the perfect game, mm -hmm. which never, of course, happens. Um, so that screen wrap happens with a one-frame window where you are at the edge of the screen and press the opposite direction, and it, it gets confused about where you're going and wraps your character around to the other side of the screen. So some really good damage boosts there. Mm -hmm. One of the things about the way the random number generation sequence works in Zelda 1 in particular, is it was based on the number of enemies you have killed since the last time you took damage. And the 10th enemy will give you something different. I think it's the 10th enemy. It's a little bit of a complicated formula, but a lot of what you're seeing here is manipulating those drops. Lord Tom spent a lot of time figuring that kind of stuff out. Now that was 
a case of movement in exact directions to force enemies to go exactly where he wanted them to. Now, we're in level four, but with a wooden sword, so it takes a lot of hits on that guy to beat him, but that's okay. Yeah. It's still the fastest route to do it in this order based on what items you pick up and how far you have to walk in the overworld to get to each of the dungeons. Yeah, there was one thing with Zelda, you can a lot of time choose which dungeon you want to uh, tackle, but um, then you are potentially missing different items. Um, what we saw here also very small hitboxes with the dragon, mm -hmm. so you could be right inside his face and he um, used it to his uh, advantage. Watch right here, you're going to see something very unusual. There's three, three fairies. Four. Four fairies. Yeah, it's not supposed to happen that yeah. way, but he basically killed all of them at the same time, so all of them produced the same result. Oh, all right. And that result was predetermined to be a fairy. So that's so, was it, in the exact same frame, so it produced yeah. fairies for everyone. Now, that yeah, was definitely showing off, but it was also to manipulate the number of enemies killed for the setup here. So it turned out to be both entertaining and... Useful. Yeah. Yes. A lot of times you'll see movies that say, take... Not a lot of times, but you'll sometimes see movies that say takes speed and entertainment trade-offs. Mm -hmm. This one is not one of those games. This game is, this run is as fast as it can possibly be, but... It's, it, still, it's still fun to watch. Yes. Yeah, as we've seen with, uh, in the last episode with the Mario Brothers 3 run, you didn't necessarily have to do all this fun stuff in the auto-scrollers, but... Ah, because, but they were auto-scrollers, so it didn't yeah. matter. So do what you like, yeah. Yeah. And that, that's that's pretty common. I don't believe that this run has any entertainment uh, or speed trade-offs. It's just pure speed, but attempts to be as entertaining as possible. Yeah, as, uh, the game works, uh, fortunately, in this way. Right. Now, as I mentioned in the last episode, I'm the ambassador for TAS Videos. I'm on-site staff. And TAS Videos has a vault category for runs that are not necessarily entertaining, but are as fast as possible. Sometimes it's just not very interesting watching uh, the fastest completion. Mm -hmm. Especially for games that maybe you're flying over most of the level or it's just boring for other reasons. It can yeah, definitely be... You're using a certain glitch and you see just five minutes of blank screen or something. Right, exactly. Or what was it? I think it was the first Final Fantasy where we have to climb the stairs for three minutes or something? Yeah, that's pretty yeah. boring. Yeah. That, that is interesting because after climbing the stairs for three minutes, you immediately finish the game, but yeah. getting there is so awful. It's entertaining because of technical stuff. Exactly. But it's, it's entertaining once. Yes. Oh, that was a pretty good damage boost. This was in route to go get the candle, which is necessary for later. You have to use that to open up one of the dungeons. So this was on the way. I believe we're going to head... Yeah, that's disgusting, isn't it? And by going down here, you save the walking animation down into the mouth of the dungeon. So mm -hmm. that using that secret exit or secret entrance saved time, believe it or not. I always thought the bombs would hurt you. And in this game, they don't. But in all other Zelda games, it seems like bombs do a lot of damage to you. They learn from this. Yeah, apparently. But I, I also, if I place the bomb, I ran out of the way. Just instinct. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> did, did you play and finish this game when you were a kid? No, not finished myself because uh, I didn't own an NES. Oh, my, really? My best uh, friend had one, so I got to play it um, with him. And of course, he finished it multiple times. Uh, I went very far and I finished it later on um, when it came out on the later systems and all these collections. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was uh, very nice to be able to finish it on your own after having only little time to get accustomed to it. If you don't know the world, it's very difficult to yeah. find out where everything is. This game is burning brutal. all the different bushes and something. Yeah. Oh man. And then what's really crazy is this is such a difficult and brutal game to learn. Then there's the randomizer community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, since we're talking about Zelda, you kind of can't not talk about it. The Zelda randomizers are amazing. And yeah, totally. the randomizer for this is is hard. It's, it's hard. You have to know where all the bushes are. You have to wander around the world, going to caves that you would never normally need to complete the game. But in many ways, it brings the game back to its roots. This game was popular in part because you could do anything and go anywhere. And the process of beating the game was in part fun. That was, that, by the way, oh, that's okay. a, That was yeah, that's, deliberate. Yes, that's deliberate. In order to 
You, you, by the way, that he played the whistle. He got the whistle into his inventory by removing bombs. Mm -hmm. to so you didn't have to get to the menu to use the whistle? Exactly. Um, but this particular game was always known for just how ruthlessly brutal it was. Yeah. And still, it's, um, I think, way more difficult than trying to play the later ones because the timing is so unforgiving and the, the enemies are so fast. I have to give credit to Breath of the Wild for finding the right mix of being a 3D game with that feeling of exploration that you had in the beginning, but without all the frustration. I think the series has grown very nicely, and I think there's a long life ahead of it if it can continue to do oh, that yeah. kind of stuff. <laughs> all right, there's some nice menu movements yes. up there. Yeah, we're seeing here one particular thing of the NES. Um, all the stuff was drawn on top of the graphics, so theoretically you could walk on it. Yep, I love that out of bounds. Same strategy as before, bomb mm -hmm. the ever-loving daylights out of this guy. <laughs> that was very well placed. And this is got disgusting. All of them. <laughs> I wish my gameplay was like yeah, this. All the, all the enemies are fast and normally unpredictable. Of course, yeah. not for the tool assisted speedrun, but I could never quite manage to find out where you're gonna run, where I'm gonna have to stab. Yeah. Randomizers for Zelda 2 and for Link to the Past are even more popular because those games lent themselves better to randomizing chests. I would say Legend of Zelda Link to the Past randomizer is one of the most amazing communities. So if you've played through Zelda before and you enjoyed it, but now you've played through it and it's not as interesting, it's a really good uh, an option to get a lot more replayability out of it. It oh, simply yeah, totally. rearranges the location of things, and there are people who speedrun it. Yeah, actually, uh, one of our co-hosts co co who couldn't be here today, unfortunately, he's an active Zelda 3 um, uh, speech, uh, randomizer speedrunner, and we had also a couple of races here oh, on, nice. our, on our format. So, and it's, it never stops. He's I, also telling me uh, I should train them, but I'm a little bit afraid. <laughs> well, <laughs> I am not a real-time runner, as we discussed in yeah. the last episode, but that doesn't stop me from making Legend of Zelda Rando my game. And I, I speedrun it. I, so I pulled it, off a two-and-a-half-hour, roughly, completion of a rando. But, but it's interesting. Would you be able something as a randomizer? Of course, you have also a kind of a seat there that you need. You, theoretically, you would be able to do a tool-assisted speedrun with a randomizer if you, you use a particular wouldn't, seat. It wouldn't likely uh, happen unless there was a very particular seed that gained a lot of notoriety. Yeah, and because and of you, the time investment to do, and you it. have kind of to to force it then so that the people want to see it, and it's the game always that, starts with its seat. That is called a plando. Okay, it's not a rando; it's a planned rando. Oh, it's okay. a plando. Uh, I learned something. <laughs> so a plando is, it can be kind of fun, and we deliberately set up plandos for the event I was telling you about earlier. Is it okay mm -hmm. if I talk about that? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Okay, sure. so we did some actual honest to goodness speedrun content which for the Taskbot community was kind of unusual. Mm -hmm. And we did it, as is typical, in the most absurd way possible. While driving across the United States in a Tesla, while letting Twitch donate using bits and through actual donations to charity, mm -hmm. while controlling the car and controlling the game. So well, not only is there randomizers for Zelda, there's also something called crowd control, made by my good buddies at Warp World. Crowd control adds an even more absurd amount of randomness because it means that people watching on a live stream on Twitch and elsewhere can control your game in subtle ways, like taking bombs away or taking arrows away. It's a lot of fun. You don't have to be a big name streamer to play with it either. You can just stream at any mm -hmm. time as long as you're an affiliate right now. Uh, hopefully it becomes available to everyone. And you can let people use bits on Twitch to control various aspects of your stream. And mm -hmm. Zelda 3, of course, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, there were the chickens. And one of the things that people can pay to do is to get you attacked by chickens. <laughs> or suddenly give you ice physics, which is really fun when you're in the middle of a, bice, uh, of a, of a boss battle. That's a classic. <laughs> so crowd control is already absurd. Mm -hmm. Doing it in a moving vehicle, on the other hand, took things to another level. And not only did we let them use crowd control on the game Zelda, Legend of Zelda, we also let them use crowd control on the Tesla, which meant that they could donate bits and turn on our seat heater in the middle of the desert or 
turn the volume up on a radio or set a random GPS destination mm -hmm. or any, any kind of ridiculous thing. So over the course of a 16-hour drive, we went from California to Salt Lake City, Utah for the RPG Limit Break mm -hmm. speedrunning uh, event. And we raised money f specifically for their charity, which is National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, and we, in fact, specifically asked for randomizer seeds that were unique in some way. And so T Sigma, as, who's part of our community, made seeds for the Axeman and I to troll us, basically, mm -hmm. to give us the craziest experiences we could possibly come up with. So they were randomized, but then he went in and tweaked things. One of the things he did that was kind of evil is he created a seed where uh, it was... It seemed like it was going to be very, very easy, except we were missing one item. I believe it was a hookshot. And to get it took going through the most absurd route. It was in logic. You could do it, but it was extremely difficult. Um, it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend anyone who doesn't... If you have a faint heart, don't try streaming from a moving vehicle like that. But. That's, that sounds kind of interesting, but also disconcerting. So sitting in there with all this stuff going on around... Well, and trying to play the game. It was okay. It, it, worked it was out okay. There was a lot of distractions already. Um, I would say the hardest part was trying to fit everything that you would find in a studio like mm -hmm. this in a car on a 200 watt power budget. But <laughs> so we called that Desert Tesla Charity Drive. That was something that the Taskbot community at Discord.task.bot and elsewhere put together. And we raised $1,600 for, for National Alliance on Mental Illness, which was awesome. And that was a very fun trip. I would do I would do it again, but I might bring more water next time because <laughs> it, it was very hot. <laughs> so could, could they also won't on your pee breaks, or were you allowed to stop when you needed to? We had designated charging stops. Oh, okay. And and you, discharging stops. Yeah. yeah, apparently, if you want to put it that way, <laughs> uh, it was a very pleasant experience. I, w I would say that it was worth it. Uh, I wanted to be able to to do something useful with with the Tesla anyway, so. It's a very fun trip. <laughs> uh, back to our run here of Legend of Zelda. This is still using a lot of the same strategies. This particular room is kind of annoying because you have to kill every single bat. And manipulating the enemy position is very difficult when you have that many enemies. You move one way and one bat goes the right favorable direction. You move another way and then go, another one goes the wrong direction. And So a lot of this is a massive amount of trial and error. That's one of the reasons that these runs can, can be so many re-records. This particular run by Lord Tom was a total of, pulling up the run now, looking at the re-record count on this one. This particular one was 35,502 re-records. Yeah. And that's based on existing earlier runs that themselves had tens of thousands of re-records on. This particular run we're watching now was a, a total overall improvement of 1,238 frames. So it saved a, a bit of time. Quite, over, quite a bit of seconds. Yes. Yeah. It's not uncommon for runs to be improved like that. And even in real-time runs, you see this. Someone runs it, they figure out a route, a strategy that works, and then people build on that and find other methods. By the way, in this case, that heart was picked up, but it was also in route, and say it took no time yeah. to get it. Normally, um, normally you skip all the hearts. Who, well, does, who does need them? It, if, it, if it takes time to do it, this run doesn't it take time doesn't to do take. it. <laughs> so, um, a lot of times, even in real-time runs, you'll have different routing that, that evolves over time. Mm -hmm. The first attempts through use a very different strategy than later attempts. Uh, that extra heart, by the way, you can now use for additional damage boosts. It's kind of handy. I don't know if this ends up getting down that low, but I think it does. Uh, so this particular improvement is only a couple of seconds, but in a tool-assisted speedrun, that's actually a pretty big deal. And yes, you can see here where that, that fourth heart was put to use for damage boosts. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about a tool-assisted speedrun is that you have an infinite amount of time to play with the game and see how fast you can make things happen. And one of the things that's interesting about the Task Videos community is they will frequently do things like create a scenario uh, where they've, they've, how do I say this? They, they finish a run and then someone comes after them and they, they save one frame, just one frame. 
and they say, oh, your, your run can't be submitted to the site. It's not optimal. <laughs> and then someone else will come along and find another frame. And we call it a frame war. And mm -hmm. They just go back and forth finding minimal improvements until the game is as polished as it can possibly be. And this happens a lot, <laughs> especially with... Especially with popular games like this. Here. Yeah. Oh. So you'll sometimes see... Oh, that's disgusting. Those this things. is just, just true. Ah, so good. Um, by the way, this guy messed with me. What's in the next room? Which room? Which next room? <laughs> and how are you supposed to know to bomb a wall yeah. in this game? How yes. are you supposed to know where what you were doing? There was, there was all it? kind of stuff. Once you <laughs> figured out that something like this is possible, you just tried it out everywhere. Yeah. Everything was stabbed, was bombed, was burned. Yeah. We're, we're coming up to the end of this particular run, but I want to talk a little bit about how I'm doing everything. Mm -hmm. I'm running a Python script, although we've also used scripts run and written in all kinds of other languages. It's sending data through a serial to USB, or USB to serial connection that's headed over to this board. I do everything in Linux. This particular laptop mm -hmm. is, I don't know if they, they can catch this laptop on the camera later, but yeah. this is a System76 laptop. It's built with Linux in mind. It, it ships with Linux out of the gate. Uh, I use this because the tools are a lot easier than running everything in Windows. Uh, by having a terminal, uh, by having a little bit better idea of what's happening on the hardware, it makes it a lot easier for me to troubleshoot what's going on. In my case, I'm running Linux Mint because it's a decent multimedia desktop environment for when I'm streaming with OBS. Uh, I do my whole stream setup on Linux as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I am obviously an advocate of Linux, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to make any compromises. Uh, the, the glitch, by the way, is expected. The screen graphic corruption is is a known side effect of, of some of the crazy <laughs> he's doing. So you don't have to use Linux necessarily, but it certainly helps. One other note I should make is that there's only one taskbot. There's one of these guys, but there's a f large number of replay devices. People have made a variety of different types of replay devices based on everything from STM to one day, boards. One day, he'll be able to do this. It's kind of terrifying. It actually. is, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's going to take over the world. We've done ones with old FPGAs, like a Papilio Pro. We had one that was called, unfortunately named, the PSOC 5. <laughs> yeah, okay. Programmable sy system on a chip. Of course. But still, very, very poor name, in my personal opinion. <laughs> oh, these, these hits were excruciating for him to optimize, by the way because there's so many of them and you have to decide which direction to go and mm -hmm. yeah half a heart though he just finishes this on so little so here's Ganon mm -hmm. uh, we picked up the bow a long time ago but never bothered to fire it until now <laughs> we have the silver silver arrows which are pretty much necessary yeah, necessary to kill him yeah yep <laughs> and then that was just yeah, showing off yeah just was showing off yeah a little bit of graphical like corruption there that always seemed really dark to me. <laughs> and... And... And when he touches the Triforce, or, or, well, touches her time. Time. Yeah. That was the whole thing. Should have been... That was 22, 19, 19, 19, 19, 17. How, what actual was the time actual time? was 22 minutes and 17 seconds. Se 17 seconds yes. and 53 Mill yeah. milliseconds. Yeah, exactly. So that was Le Le Legend of Zelda 1. Mm -hmm. I'd like to do one more thing. I'd like to do Legend of Zelda 2. Of course. Adventure of Link. We had, the, we had here a regular speedrunner who did this. I think he did about an hour plus something. Let's see how fast it takes here. Okay. So this is going to be a very different completion. So I'm going to turn the console off. Yeah. This one, fortunately, I don't believe needs to have the contents of the cartridge erased. If it does, it's not much fun to do it. Uh, I'm going to get this here. And three, two, one, go. So this is Legend of Zelda 2. Okay. Uh, doesn't take any prisoners. No. No, it doesn't take any flack from anyone. This yeah. uses a glitch called the scroll lock glitch. And you'll get the idea All right. pretty quickly. All right. It, it breaks the game badly. <laughs> so we just ended up someplace completely different. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to follow. It's kind of hard to follow. I've done my best to try to understand everything that's going on here and I my brain starts leaking out of my ear 
So yeah, the <laughs> Zelda 2 of course has a bit more physics since it's a side scroller. You have different jumping abilities. You have different uh, ways the um, enemies uh, behave. But here it seems if you yeah if you find the right right thing to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just okay. Go through a wall. It's totally so here, normal. here normally you should have the candle to be able to see in the dark. But if you know where everything is, you don't need to see. And then we're okay. That, that was, was a death warp. That was a death warp, a restart. Yep, again used controller two to press a button combination that put us back at the very beginning, but retained all of the items we had. This is so absurd. So I'm excited to see how long this run is going to be, because you have quite a number uh, of things to collect uh, to be able to finish the game. You have to finish some of the dungeons. It's not that fast. I am still, even now, after so many events and so many runs, I'm still paranoid that something is going to desynchronize. Yeah, we, we <laughs> and then we maybe don't even know because the game is crazy anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is things that, of course, can happen with because of one thing or the other, um, where you're still giving the inputs to the console, but because of one reason or the other, it's not in the correct frame anymore, and then it doesn't work. Yeah, desynchronizes. Uh, we call that a desync because we need to be in exact lockstep, in exact synchronization with the the specific sequence that w that is predetermined if you will if we get off by one frame or even a single button press things aren't consistent anymore okay so we're here now <laughs> okay <laughs> so uh, everything that's been done through uh, through tool assisted runs if there was real randomness so to speak of if it was real random elements in the game and not um, determined by one or the other factor then this wouldn't be possible wouldn't be possible at all. yeah yeah so all this is get... not artificial intelligence yeah so all we're seeing here there is uh, all, all it's dependent on random number generators and how you manipulate them exactly so this is a good time to pause and say there's more than just nintendo console emulations i've only shown nintendo console content here, in part because of the difficulty of getting a good capture. We struggled rather substantially here just today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have equipment at home that's purpose-built for getting a clean signal out of out of a console, but we struggled substantially trying to, to get a good capture out of this. How, how is it when you go to, to other events like the ESA or GDQ? Of well, course, they, they have a lot of prepared stuff there because exactly. there's so many runners there. You, yeah. you, you find what you need there often or have to carry a lot of, of your own stuff there? I don't have to carry a whole lot there. I do, however, have to be conscientious when some overly confident technician says, oh, I can do everything. I can do this. I went to DEF CON and presented in Las Vegas in 2016. Mm -hmm. DEF CON being a hacking convention that is kind of well known. Uh, there was an overconfident union AV guy at the hotel who was absolutely positive there would be no problems and he could do anything I could mm -hmm. possibly need. And he couldn't capture the signal. <laughs> and it, it comes down to the Nintendo and the Super Nintendo were designed for a CRT television, a cathode ray tube television, and they don't necessarily consistently draw the first horizontal line. The Super Nintendo is especially bad about it, but even the Nintendo is a little bit funky, and as we discovered today, can be a little bit a bit different from one game to the next. Yeah, that's that's kind of a revelation that you can get a single with one game and not with the other. Yeah, I so. didn't actually expect that. So, what? Good to learn. Yes, very good to learn. That death, by the way, was intentional. Mm -hmm. That allows us to come back. In fact, we're going to die, I believe, one more time here. That gets us. Yeah, to, now we're yeah. yeah we're now we're a fairy and now we can we're just wander through walls. And, sure. Sure. But deliberate damage there in order to die again. <laughs> uh, we're almost done with this. So the last thing I'll say, though, is that five minutes. the video signal that we've got here is very, very good. But the device I'm using, the OSSC, is designed to be as low latency as possible. So it's picking up the timing from the original console and passing it through, which means that broadcast standards video capture equipment doesn't necessarily like it. Yeah, it's not a converter, it's a line doubler, so to speak, That's so right. that you have so little delay as possible. Exactly. Huh? It does add about a frame, oh, so maybe we have two, but it's very good. I can play consistently with it. I do use a professional video monitor at home, though, when I play. And that, I believe, as soon as he touches the Triforce, is time. Uh, time. Yep.
There it is. Yep. 5.38 in our time. How is, what is the, the actual time? The then? time on that was 5.31, actually. 5.31. <laughs> so it turns yes. out he stopped input a lot earlier than I thought. Yeah, yeah. We put the start. <laughs> That's a common trick, by the way, because uh, RTA time starts from pressing start on a game, for mm -hmm. instance, in, in Mario 3, mm -hmm. and ends when the game, uh, well, when, when, you've, when you've pressed the last input. Yeah. On the TAS... It starts from power on. Okay. And this can sense. lead to some problems between the RTA community and the speed, the, the task community. Of course, sometimes how, how you found it. Here we saw when you powered it on, we almost immediately were inside the game. Yes. So it was quite fast there. Yeah, which wouldn't be fair to a real time runner. So it's understandable that they're different. Oh, I oh. forgot that they did it that way. So this is examples of the type of content you can find on task videos mm -hmm. obviously the vast majority of content is is not being done in a re on real hardware mm -hmm. uh, you can watch a lot of runs that will probably never sync on real hardware specifically runs for the original playstation and runs for the wii although we're working on it anyway uh we're bad we're trying we're You're trying if You're we can trying. replace the spinning disc which there's no way we could ever put it in the same side same way in the same location and have it rotate exactly the same and have the laser at the same temperature every time so that it's consistently the same read speed impossible we just can't handle that many variables so we're looking at replacing the spinning disc with yeah, a um, sd card drive up to right you know? at a certain point though you don't want to modify any more than you absolutely have to and also at a certain point, you have to worry about one other minor problem, which is you don't really want to irritate the manufacturers of the console too much. See, we really want to make a TAS replay on a Switch. Mm -hmm. That would be amazing. More than that, we specifically want to work with Able Gamer and other organizations that help gamers with limited mobility mm -hmm. be able to play. And one of the things that the TaskBot community has built is a device that sits between a Microsoft accessibility controller yeah. and the Switch. But we took it one step further. We added in the ability to add macro support, which means that... So pre-programmed sequences. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And this is an important point that I wanted to bring up here in this episode before we conclude, in part because there's very distinct communities. As we discussed in the last episode, the original community for speed games for speed demos archives that did rta runs and now speed game uh speed speedrun.com and elsewhere those communities have a very strict no cheating policy which basically means no tools and on the other side of the equation you have tool assisted speedruns at task videos which are expected to be frame perfect they're yeah. expected to be immaculate but there's this gray area of things in between something called human theory runs i won't get into things like a person who has limited mobility, maybe they only have the ability of using one hand, maybe they have other challenges that prevent them from button mashing at 10 hertz, but they would still like to enjoy a video game and they still enjoy participating in speedruns. Half Coordinated is a well-known yeah. streamer who plays with only one hand because his right hand is incapable of doing anything more than very minimal holding. He can't do anything more advanced than that. And yet, he, by doing everything with one hand, he can complete some very interesting games. But there are challenges even for him, even with his skill level. There are some games that are just not possible for him to easily play. And we want to break down that barrier specifically for speedrunners. He's not the only one. There's actually a very thriving community for it. I think in part because of the amazing aspects of, of working past that challenge and still being able to do something great. But we'd like to expand the library of what they can do. And the challenge comes down to if we use this Microsoft accessibility controller and we add macro support, predefined sequences of button presses, mm -hmm. maybe you have to have the timing right, but you hit the button at the right time to do a dodge roll at the exact moment an enemy attacks you to get around from behind and then attack. But there's a number of buttons and, and sequences that you have to be able to execute to pull that off. If we can do that with a single button with a macro. But now, where are you? You're not an SDA. You use tools. You're not in a task videos. You didn't do it Somewhere perfectly. in between, yeah. You're in this gray area in between. And we're trying to work with other communities to create a, a space for that kind of content. But we're also trying to work with folks like Able Gamer and other organizations 
to try to develop better tools for them. If we can take this accessibility controller and macros and make it work reliably, it, it unlocks the ability for people who aren't even speedrunning to experience stories they wouldn't any other way. And one of the challenges of that is, at least on modern consoles, the input and the display are completely decoupled. We can reliably do what we do here because every single frame, in our case with an NTSC console, every 60th of a second, it both asks the controller for input and displays an image on the screen, unless there's a lag frame where there's too much processing happening for it to ask the controller. But that also means that it didn't advance the RNG sequence either. So that's fine for us. That doesn't apply to a switch. The rate at which it's pulling the controller and the rate that it's displaying an image on HDMI are completely decoupled. Mm -hmm. And there's no way for us currently to know when the edge of a frame is. So, so, so you're investigating and seeing if there's a way to solve this problem. And the way is unfortunately interesting. In order to make a Nintendo Switch specifically easier for, uh, for us to talk to from a controller perspective, we have to hack it, <sighs> right? Now, we've modified this console, this physical console, to get a cleaner video path. And also, as you might have noticed from the earlier episode, we've added a reset wire. Yeah, But, but those did change not, the gameplay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not hack per se. You're still using the right. real hardware. You have real controller inputs Exactly. Here. Yeah. We need to make about the same amount of invasiveness. We're not going to change the timing of the game any. We just need to insert a hook in to grab the input out as, uh, as, the, as it's being processed. Basically, mm -hmm. so that we can inject button presses at a much more reliable rate. But doing that, even though it doesn't change how the game works at all, is a little more dicey on a Nintendo Switch. You asked me earlier, I don't know if, if it was a section we've recorded, but you asked me earlier, what does Nintendo's lawyers, what, are the, what do Nintendo's lawyers feel about, like, about this? And the mm -hmm. answer is, so far, we're using consoles like the Nintendo, the Super Nintendo, Game Boy, that don't have any encryption. Therefore, it does not violate specifically the United States Digital Millennium Copyright Act. But that goes out the window when you start... When they go to later consoles. Yes. So we're in this interesting place. We want to do the right thing to help other communities, but doing the right thing puts us at a certain amount of risk. So we're trying to walk that tightrope, trying to figure out what can we do that helps Nintendo's fans, not mm -hmm. hinders and do it in a way that doesn't get us shut down. So it's, it's an interesting challenge. It's, uh, it's something that's scary. It's, really, it's a lot of stuff to think about, Yeah, actually. Yeah, but uh, I think if people want to um, continue following you, of course, test boards or other tool assisted speedrunners, they are all over the place, especially testvideos.com as a central hub. But of course, when you're at GDQ, at ESA or other stuff, or if you want to come again on Speedrunner, you're of course uh, welcome. We want to show maybe some uh, switch runs then when it's that finally solved. That would be a solved. lot of fun. I'd also love to demonstrate at some point in the future runs that run natively on Linux and other fun stuff like that. If you'd like to be a part of this community, by all means, TAS, uh, Task.bot has stuff we've done for console verification. Mm -hmm. Taskvideos.org has actual tool-assisted speedruns. The best community, in my personal opinion, anywhere on Discord is my own. I'm a little biased, but we run a very amazing Discord. You can go to discord.task.bot to get part of our community, and we mm -hmm. do have other German-speaking uh, individuals there. You see, then you could also be at home, even if you're from Germany. That's right. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you for letting me rant about some of my favorite topics. Of course, we're always here for this. Um, if you want to contact us, wenn ihr mit uns uh, hier teilnehmen, sprechen wollt, alles andere, speedrandale at rocketbeans.tv, kennt ihr ja. Or if you're English speaking or otherwise understand English, you're also welcome to write us at uh, speedrandale at rocketbeans.tv. And then maybe we'll find an opportunity like this for all the people that are watching in English. And hopefully you're getting famous in Germany. That would be fun. <laughs> would be fun. Other than David Hasselhoff. <laughs> Thanks for watching and have a good day.